Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon all of you. Welcome to our third episode of Islam and Life. And thank you for welcoming us into your home once again. My name is Maymuna Hussain, and this is Brother Khalid Al Qazaz. As uh, always, before we begin anything, we say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin with the remembrance and praise of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. As we begin anything that we hope will be of goodness, Insha'Allah. And so we re begin with uh, some recitation from the Holy Quran. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالِمِينَ صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خير um, and as we begin, we acknowledge uh, that uh, we are here uh, on this part of Turtle Island, which is part of the treaty lands of the Mississaugas, of the Credit, and that for us as Muslims, we really recognize it as part of our faith to serve all of humanity and creation um, as commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to address injustices wherever we see it around us with a concern for people and of all of creation. Uh, so this week, as we approach the end of Black History Month in Canada, we are really looking to center the conversation around two dimensions. Celebrating the resilience, accomplishments, and the power of narrative in being black Canadian Muslims. Sister Mimuna, if I, uh, just before we get into the, into the topic of uh, today, if okay. I may interrupt, I, uh, I think it's important as we do this show in a live uh, fashion uh, that uh, especially when there are like life uh, changing uh, uh, incidents around us that we make that uh, connection and also link it to what we're doing here uh, uh, today with this uh, show and as everybody woke up this morning to uh, the horrific news of the Russian invasion to Ukraine I think it's important that we see this uh, big picture uh, we'll continue with the same subject that we have uh, today. However, it's important to put this as part of that big picture of uh, justice that we're attempting to approach uh, today uh, as well into uh, uh, the Islamic perception on, uh, on, uh, on justice in general. And we see that manifest in multiple ways. Uh, so this notion of this invasion is related to uh, the notion of uh, people are articulating it through international justice through uh, different manifestations of uh, uh, applying uh, international law and so on. Uh, and we see that notion of justice applied across different spheres and different levels. And today we're going to talk about uh, social justice, a social, an important social justice element that's uh, related to racism and specifically uh, 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 black racism. And before we begin, we just want to uh, acknowledge and uh, offer our condolences to all the lost lives and people who've lost their uh, uh, livelihood as well. And we hope and pray for the uh, 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 peace and peace and, and justice uh, for everyone. Uh, back to you, Sister Jazakallah khair. Uh, thank you, Brother Khalid. That is an important uh, interruption, actually. And we know that it's on everybody's mind today. Um, and, and really, uh, the show Islam in Life, and we hope over the coming weeks, uh, you know, is to really unpack and look at these things that are on our minds and uh, that are happening on a day in, day out basis through an Islamic framework. And how do we make sense of things that um, erupt around us? So uh, thank you, Brother Khalid. And uh, let's continue with our episode. But yes, uh, Inshallah, these are the types of things that we want to think about, and how do we think about this social justice narrative um, and uh, and uh, you know happenings around the world, and then the Islamic framework and uh, bridge all of those together. So, uh, in terms of Black History Month in Canada, uh, what we want to do tonight is really look at centering the conversation around two dimensions. Uh, the first being celebrating the resilience, accomplishments, and the power of narrative in being black Canadian Muslims, but also secondly, looking at and dissecting really the narrative around black Muslims in Canada and trying to understand how that 
narrative has developed? Um, what does the Islamic framework contribute to that current anti-black racism discourse? And so our guests are going to share about their own journey and engage in this conversation with us. Uh, but before we go there, um, let's take a look at what our researchers have put together to kind of contextualize our conversation tonight. So take a look. The Government of Canada has designated February as Black History Month. Every February, people across Canada participate in Black History Month events and festivities that honour the legacy of Black Canadians and their communities. The Government of Canada designated the 2022 theme for Black History Month as February and Forever, celebrating Black history today and every day which focuses on recognizing the daily contributions that Black Canadians make to Canada, thus inviting Canadians to learn more about these communities and how they can continue to help shape the story of Canada. Last year, Sister Naima Ali, an educator and social justice activist, published an article with the CBC where she wrote about one such community, Black Muslims in Canada. In her article, she explains how, for Black Muslims in Canada, multiple layers of identity intersect and create a very complex reality. A 2019 study found that the Black Muslim population in Canada today accounts for more than 9% of this country's Muslim population and 0.3% of all Canadians. Despite its size, the community's impact is profound particularly while negotiating the compounded oppressions of anti-Black racism and Islamophobia. These are not simply stories of success, but stories of resilience and perseverance, of Black Muslim Canadians who have faced systemic discrimination, yet are actively participating and contributing with Ihsan. We see the likes of historian and scholar Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick and Islamic scholar and community leader Sheikh Abdullah Idris Ali, both of who have been pivotal in developing and shaping the Muslim community in Canada. The Honorable Ahmed Hussein, who has served as an MP and Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion. Basketball players Fatriya Muhammad and Bilqis Abdul Qadir, who are activists creating space for Muslim women in sports. Long distance runner and three time Olympian and medalist Muhammad Ahmed. Human rights activist and award-winning Canadian federal public servant, Farhia Ahmed. The first hijab-wearing Canadian news anchor, Janella Massa. Children's author, Rahma Muhammad, and the list goes on. However, as Canadian historian and Black Muslim scholar, Dr. Afwa Cooper has said, one of the functions of racist discourse is to write black people out of Canadian history and position us as newcomers, that we started to come after the Second World War and maybe even later, that our presence is a recent one and not a 400-year presence. We know that the history of black Muslims in Canada dates back to the 1700s with the impact of important figures like Richard Pierpoint, a Muslim of Senegalese origin, who was enslaved and brought to America. Pierpoint was eventually granted freedom and settled in Upper Canada, where he was pivotal in developing small black communities. Today, a memorial plaque is posted honoring Richard Pierpoint in St. Catharines, Ontario, as part of the Niagara Freedom Trail. Our conversation today also looks to understand and explore how black Muslims in North America and Canada continue to contribute to rise in excellence and champion various causes by grounding themselves within the Islamic framework. Similar to the likes of the late Malcolm X, Malik al-Shabazz, and Muhammad Ali, may Allah have mercy on them, who stood firm in their belief and profoundly declared their Muslim identity as they led the civil rights movement. Both successfully broke barriers and chose to lead outside of the boxes which society tried to confine them within. They successfully expanded and balanced the discourse on black racism and achieved justice through a strong, non-compromising Muslim voice. Today, we will have a conversation with two black Muslim women who are shaping the discourse and defining what it means to be black Muslim Canadians through the spheres of education and writing. Join us now for this conversation with Sister Muna Osman, 
a social worker and children's author, and Sister Naima Ali, a community activist and educator. Um, so as we begin our conversation uh, this evening, I'll ask Brother Khaled uh, to introduce our speakers, uh, our guests, with a little more context, inshallah. Okay, uh, I hope uh, our guests are on. Uh, thank you, uh, our research team, for, uh, um, for this uh, 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 interesting introduction. And uh, I see we have uh, Sister Nama Ali here on. We've hosted Sister Nama uh, uh, on the first episode, and we're happy to have her back again. Uh, to share more about her experience as a, a, a black Muslim uh, uh, activist in Canada in different spheres in the education uh, field as a principal in, uh, uh, in justice issues with the Abdurrahman Abdi campaign and even uh, with uh, students in, on campuses uh, through her work as a chaplain uh, in the University uh, in, in Ottawa. And uh, uh, we really hope to carry a conversation with her. Uh, I'll introduce the second guest when, uh, when, she, when, when she comes on board, Sister Maimuna. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Nama. Thank you so much for being here uh, with us. We want to start with the personal question, um, if that's okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your own personal story? What kinds of challenges as a visible black Muslim Canadian uh, you've faced and how you've addressed these challenges uh, you know, through and perhaps how Islam has played a role in this for you? Uh, Sister Nama, um, for some reason we cannot hear you. Are you on mute by chance? Just when I finish my entire conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for everything you explained. <laughs> uh, to keep it short now, uh, yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh yeah. to you and to your audience. Um, it's really a great pleasure being here with you. Um, and also, uh, we owe a great um, you know, gratitude to Muslim Association of Canada for creating this platform for us to share a dialogue and a discussion. Uh, my journey is actually very similar to many, many uh, immigrants who came to this country to, um, you know, establish uh, running away from war and, and looking at, you know, a place to call home. Um, it, challenges from adjusting to snow, learning the language um, and, uh, you know, establishing home here in Canada is, is not a, an easy matter. And we see a wave of immigrants coming year after year and that you know, struggle starts from everywhere, just leaving, um, uh, you know, your home and everything that is very close to you um, and losing, you know, a lot of uh, uh, items that are important to you because of, of a civil war. But also reestablishing a country that where the language is new, uh, the weather is new, the people and your neighbors are new, a place that no one knows your name. Uh, so that itself is a challenge that, uh, uh, alhamdulillah, still I can remember vividly over 30 years how that challenge felt. But I am one of those, uh, you know, lucky individuals right from the get go, um, find the community of Muslim Association of Canada, having Muslims around, uh, attending regular halaqas, um, you know, having um, a community to call home, uh, away from home from home. So I think in my challenge has been growing with that community and learning with that community as well. Thank you, Sister Nama. And uh, before uh, getting into the call in our prep, you uh, uh, you actually taught me something new, uh, and and I wasn't sure about it because uh, we as Egyptians, uh, I have an Egyptian background, and uh, we uh, are between uh, between nations actually. So we are, we're we're in the African continent. Continent. We're uh, we're Arabs, and we uh, even as she was saying also, we have also mixed uh, with. Uh, European uh, neighbors as well. So uh, 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 she's saying that I have space uh, into the conversation around uh, black Muslims here. And I responded to her, actually, I feel more connection there apart from that uh, geographical positioning through uh, Sahabi like uh, Sayyidina Bilal ibn Rabah. I connect to, to that cause him, what he saw through his journey to Islam. And as a Muslim, I actually feel 
connected to that cause through Sayyidina Bilal ibn Rawah and many of the Sahaba, Ridwanullah alayhi. So it's we have amazing. Sister Mo Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so we, uh, we just uh, uh, got uh, Sister Mona on, on the call now, and she's uh, from Edmonton. So uh, it was actually exactly Maghrib time when we uh, started. So thank you, may Allah SWT accept, accept from you. And uh, we were happy to be introduced uh, to her as a, uh, she, was, she was introduced to us as a writer, and she's also started to publish her uh, uh, stories. Uh, uh, and she herself has a personal journey uh, that is actually uh, very important for us to share here and listen to. So we start uh, by welcoming her and asking her to share with us uh, some of her journey uh, as, uh, as, uh, as a black Muslim uh, coming here to Canada. Oh, you, it seems that you're on mute as well. Uh, uh, we Okay, so Sister uh, Mona, try to uh, resolve the, if, once you resolve the uh, audio issue, we will go back to Sister Nama. I interrupted you against Sister Nama, so please go ahead. Yes, one of the fascinating things about uh, Egypt being part of Africa, for us actually, I take a lot of great inspiration when it comes to the story of Musa, uh, as well as um, Hajar, whether it's she has been the daughter or the servant or one of the Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, it's fascinating how Hagar was the mother who established um, the Kaaba with her son Ishmael and the Zamzam water. Um, so for me, some of the strength stories that I go back to the Sira is actually through the Egyptian African Egyptian stories uh, back in the day I know that uh, the shade of the color of the Egyptians has been changing you guys have been mixed of Europeans and colonization here and there I'm not a historian I'm just you know going with my own knowledge but there is a lot of great um, um, African um, stories that really go down to the history of Ad Egypt as well Sister, uh, Sister Muna, do we have you back? Yes. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much for I being am, here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and I apologize for the technical issues. Yes. Um, my name is Muna Osman. I am a Somali Canadian woman living in Edmonton. I am a social worker. I have trained as a social worker in Ontario, actually, in Toronto and Ottawa and moved out here to Edmonton about six years ago where I started practicing social work. I am also a self-published writer. I have noticed a major lack of literature that's focused at black children, um, black families, Muslim and black families. So I have recently published two children's stories and I am really glad to be here with you and share this uh, conversation about this important topic of black Muslims in Canada and uh, throughout the world. Thank you. I want to build on this, uh, Sister Mona, you, you know, you said that you noticed there was a gap in literature and that's what drove you to write. And so from your perspective, um, you know, why is it important for us to look at these stories and highlight these stories? And, you know, what's missing and, you know, what does this contribute? Absolutely, um, a big, big gap. And I, I should go back and say there's always been a gap in literature or stories about the marginalized groups. So as far back as I can remember, even in my high school days, I remember thinking, oh, I want to read a story about a Muslim family. I, wanna, I would read African uh, novels and show the stories, and I would feel that lack of not being represented in African literature sometimes or not being represented in literature that's for Muslim people. So I've always felt this gap. But coming to Canada and living here and uh, having my own children, I have actually uh, been a big fan of public libraries all my life. And I would go to the library and look for books that tell our stories from our perspective. And it's often really difficult to find these books. There might be a couple of books here and there about um, uh, like children of color, but oftentimes you find that the individual writing it is not writing it from our perspective. It might be an outsider. So 
that gap is something that I believe our children feel from elementary school to primary to high school and follows them through their life because either their stories are missing from the public narrative, the Canadian narrative, or when their stories are told, they are told from a perspective that's not theirs, that they cannot identify with. So this is um, definitely something that I'm very passionate about, not just having our stories out there, but having our real stories out there, our authentic stories out there, and having our communities and our children have access to books as well. So this takes us to the discourse on, uh, uh, on blacks in general and, and, and even more specifically about black Muslims. And uh, the question is actually to, to both of you. And I, in actually preparing for this uh, show tonight, we ran through these uh, conversations and we seem to have noticed that uh, uh, some people are, uh, in, in the, the guests that we, 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 we spoke to, uh, basically feel that the narrative around uh, uh, black racism has been l put in a specific box where there are so many limitations and limited narratives and perspectives that address this issue in an attempt to really uh, uh, keep the discussion and discourse in one particular, one particular way. And that's really part of the discussion we had before and we wanted you to uh, comment on this and see what are other angles that we can perceive. So even the example that the sister Nama mentioned around uh, even uh, Egyptian connections and others, she's expanding the way she's expanding that narrative around uh, 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 black Muslims. So can you, can you comment on this? I will go. Um, I think Sister Nimao may have may have a lot more experience with the narratives around Black Muslims having campaigned in this specific topic. But in my personal experience, I think we often see very uh, narrow angle of stories highlighted. So, for example, when we speak about the very prominent uh, and extreme issue of police brutality against Black people, we might hear about uh, narrow story about what the individual that was shot was involved in, for example. They'll talk about their past or they'll talk about um, something that they did wrong, but it's often limited to their perspective. We don't hear for about as much about maybe black women that were brutalized by the police. We might not hear about the, the stories that the family of the individual that we've lost, the stories that their family tells about them their successes, their accomplishments, things that they were passionate about. So the, the um, thing that stays in the limelight is that typical negative stereotype of what we think when we hear like a, black, a young black man was shot, for example. And that leaves out a lot of the stories. On the flip side, we might hear about Islamophobia and how Muslims face um, Islamophobia from individuals, from governments, from systems but we often will not hear that um, intersection of being both black and being Muslim and being marginalized on all fronts. Thank you, Sister Nema, do you want to comment here? Sister Nema, can you hear us? Um, is, yes, <laughs> mashallah, jazakallah khair, and it's a pleasure to meet you virtually, um, uh, Sister Hodo, mashallah. Mona, Mona. Uh, Mona, Mona, yes, absolutely. Uh, different meanings of her name can be Hodo as well. <laughs> um, so I think the question comes back to, um, are we trying to tackle these issues? Are, are Muslims or not Muslims? Because uh, in our faith, when it comes to the Islam, we have a specific guidelines. I understand that many uh, Muslim community might even kind of uh, raise an eyebrow to say, really, you know, this is a religion of unity. Why are we dividing um, in different boxes? Why are we talking about women? Why are we talking about black? Why, you know, Muslims are Muslims. We are brothers and sisters. Uh, we're supposed to be united. So it's kind of like 
if, if I take it on the route of a Muslim perspective, we hide under the blanket of if we talk about the issue of racism, if we talk about the issue of um, Black uh, History Month or even um, the struggle of police brutality and the issues that uh, some of the Black Muslim communities are facing, then it becomes that us, if we are standing up to divide uh, the Muslim community, and, and that is absolutely the contrary. Uh, we all understand as, you know, blacks or non-blacks or Arabs or in any any shade of color we are, as Muslims, one thing we agree 100% is that the Prophet Sallallahu outlined for us, especially on his last speech, the farewell speech on Hajjatul Wada, that the Prophet Sallallahu said, all of you are from Adam and Adam is uh, from a dust. There is no virtue, you know, uh, Arab or non over non Arabs, or uh, vice versa, or there's no, uh, you know, a virtue over a white person over a black person. There is no dispute on that, and we have many ayat that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying that diversity is your beauty. Even uh, when Brother Khalid was opening the ayah in the Quran, he, you know, and he's talking, he was talking about women ayatihi, you know, some of the miraculous things of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation is that our diversity, our language, the color of our skin is as miraculous as the heavens and the earth. So when we talk about um, uh, black and black Muslims, uh, please, you know, don't, don't, uh, think that uh, even for a second we are dividing the community we want to heal the community but i want you to think about it in the perspective of the hadith the prophet sallallahu said we are like one body if one if if one body if your finger or your nail is hurting you can feel the pain for your whole body so the question is as a muslim community uh, if uh, uh, Muslim Canadians now in Canada are uh, black individuals are 9% of the entire population, if that 9% is hurting or 4 or 5% of them is hurting and lost so many sons and daughters to violence, to poverty, where, where do we stand on that hadith the Prophet Wasallam said, if one piece of your body is hurting the whole body is supposed to hurt because as muslims we're supposed to be just muwahid so in order to heal our body or that little finger that's hurting or that community that's hurting and going through challenging it could be racism it could be black um, uh, the color it could be uh, whatever they're going through, then we need to talk about it to get to the root of it. So I think, I don't know if I answer your question, Brother Khalid, but I think in Muslim perspective, it is important to have conversations when we are facing challenges. Thank you, Sister Nama. Um, I want, so I think where we've started is we've been talking about why it's important to have these conversations and look at diversity within the anti-black racism discourse, um, that there isn't one single dominant narrative, uh, the black Muslim narrative being one of them. And then we're getting into this, uh, you know, conversation around social justice issues within Islam and how Islam looks at these things. So I want to now, uh, you know, continue this and talk about then when we talk about diversifying and adding layers and looking at the complexity that the entire anti-black racism discourse has, right? Not just one dominant. What and how does Islam contribute to this wider conversation on anti-black racism? And I open that to any one of you to uh, start us off. I think Islam has a lot to say in the conversation about diversity and racial equality. I think uh, egalitarianism and equality in, within the whole human population is the cornerstone message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like the sister mentioned and from the ayahs that we open with, we, we know in Islam from the Quran, from the Sunnah of the Prophet that we are all treated equally. We are all equal in the sight of Allah that uh, no Arab or non-Arab is superior to, like no, no one is superior to another one based on the color of their skin, whether they are Arab, non-Arab, whether they speak Arabic or not. So with that message, and this is what, there's a story about Brother Malcolm X discovering this when he went to Hajj and noticing how just the simple act of standing next to 
the other Muslims. Like everyone is standing in, on the same line. There is no superiority or inferiority. There is no king or servant. There is no Arab, non-Arab, black, white. How that beautiful, just beautiful act of ibadah tells, shows us that we are all equal in the sight of Allah. And this is the message that uh, he came back with, realizing that the message of true brotherhood is in Islam. So I would actually go as far as to say we don't, someone doesn't have to be a Muslim to understand and appreciate what Islam says about racial equality, given when we hear the stories of the Sahaba, people that were non-Arab that were around the Prophet, how they were treated, how they were revered, how they were held in such high esteem. And this just tells us that it, Islam is for everyone. And we can't even apply Islamic principles and values around racial equality to everything in life. Again, it does not have to be a Muslim sister Maimuna or a black. You mentioned how we believe as Muslims that social justice is the work of all Muslims. We talk about the rights of indigenous people in Canada. That is something that as a Muslim, we should value and we should care about and we should work for. Just like if you are a Muslim and you are non-black, that the oppression of black people, the marginalization of black people should still be something that you care about, that we all work for, because it's in the message of Islam to fight for social justice. It's in the message of Islam that we're all equal in, front, in the eyes of Allah. And it's in the message of Islam that we should support each other when one of our brothers or sisters is, um, is ha harmed. That is why I believe following Islamic perspective and the narrative can be viewed through, through the message of Islam. And I think that would actually solve a lot of crisis within our ummah as Muslims. Jazakumullah khair. And I'm really enjoying this discussion because we're actually going through multiple layers of the discourse around uh, 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 anti-black anti -black racism and, and even wider, wider perspectives. We, we, we discuss the issue, the, the, the discourse uh, the community-wide discourse and different uh, different angles. We discussed the uh, discourse within the black uh, community as well, and we discussed also the community with the discussion within the Muslim community on uh, on black Muslim issues. So we've we've gone through multiple multiple layers here, and there are d distinctions and uh, uh, complexities there. But another perspective is actually how the discourse is being carried, and there is so much emphasis on the oppression and the racism uh, uh, angle and dimension. And we see much less discourse on the strength and the resilience that individual uh, uh, black people and black Muslims have shown and actually many success stories. And we actually chose to start this uh, show from that story of, uh, 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 from these stories of strength and actually being in the company of two very uh, uh, strong individuals that we've, we're interacting with and attempting to change this narrative and this discourse. So my comment to you is really where does, my question to you is where, which angle do you prefer to, to discuss and do we do one versus the other or we engage in both, uh, in both discussions? Let's start with Sister Nama. Jazakallah khair, um, Brother Khalid, that's really, really an important question. And I would say that um, it will depend where the person is at. Um, four years ago, when I was, you know, witnessed the police brutality of Abdurrahman uh, Abdi, and we were fighting for his, you know, standing over, uh, you know, uh, his grave and uh, fighting for his justice, all I can think about and all I could address was the struggle um, the mistreatment, the challenge. And if anybody tells me to, uh, at that time, if anybody told me to talk about the positive narratives, I would say, that's not where I'm at. I'm grieving, I'm hurting, and this is what I need to address. And Alhamdulillah, the Muslim community and also the non-Muslim community who was around us, whether it's churches and uh, uh, community leaders and mosques came together to help that family and really channel that energy in a prospective way. So I think to answer your question that where we tackle, it depends where the person is at. Uh, today, we can say that as an educator who 
four years later of going to court and dealing with lawyers and police, I would say where I am at as an educator is to empower Muslim youth and, and Muslim younger generations to say, let's talk about your legacy. Let's talk about the story, forgotten stories in, in the store, uh, sorry, in the Islam. Let's talk about beyond Bilal in Islam. Let's talk about all my life as a child who grew up, who being a, who have been raised in Islam, the the mothers of the Prophet وسلم, that I only knew was Amina and Halima bint Sa'diya. Lately, for the last 10 years, I realized he had another very important mother who really was beside his, uh, um, uh, you know, his from birth to death, over 63 years of his life. Uh, why was that story never told? Why was that story was not emphasized in Muslim countries? Was it because she was a woman? Was it because she was a slave? Was it because she was, uh, a, you know, a black woman? But he, the Prophet wasallam, if you go back to that hadith, he calls Ummu Ayman Baraka, uh, uh, the, uh, my mother after my mother, right? All the amazing hadith, if you listen to the Prophet wasallam, he talks about her as she was woman of Jannah. My, my mother after my mother, he literally massaged and touched her feet when she did her second hijrah. So those are the legacies that we never taught as a Muslim black woman. So when our daughters and brother Khalid when, and sister Maimuna, when your brothers and sisters, when your black brothers and sisters are struggling, those are the stories that we need to remind them and say, look at your legacy. Look at Umm Ayman and how much she overcame. Look what the Prophet Wasallam said about her. Look how he said she is a woman of Jannah, yet she had no resource, she had no government, she had no protection. But she reached the status of being woman of Jannah. None of us know if we're going to be those who are in Jannah. So I think it depends what story we tell and at what time we tell that story. And are we going to tell the story of resilience or are we going to tell the story of my struggle? It depends where your brothers and sisters, where your black brothers and sisters, where they're at and exactly what they're going through. We cannot say, oh, I don't want to hear about you whining and complaining. That's not where I'm at. I only want to talk about the positive because maybe that's not where they're at. They're hurting and they need to talk about that. Just like no clear. Thank you, Sister Nitma. That, mm -hmm. I just that's want to a beautiful remind answer. those of you that are uh, with us uh, live uh, that we are going to be getting to your questions very soon. So uh, you can either type them into YouTube and we'll try to get to those or if you would like to call in live and ask your question to our sisters tonight, um, you can do so. Uh, join us through uh, Zoom and the meeting ID is 905-822-2626. And I'll go back to Sister Mona. I think you wanted to add something. Yes, that is a beautiful way of explaining uh, the duality in the narratives about black people. But the only thing I would like to add is we definitely need to hear stories of resiliency and success. We need to know about black Muslims and Muslims that have accomplished, that have contributed, that have a name in the history. But as human beings, as Muslims, we also need to understand that people don't have to be successful in, in our like sense or in our understanding or have to contribute or have to be excellent for us to recognize their humanity. So yes. we need to know the full range of stories. We are not uh, one thing. We are not all good, but all good. We are not all bad. We are not all successful. We don't all have the same narratives. I think we need to know the full um, like range of stories so that we recognize the full humanity of black people or black of black Muslims. And I think that gives room for everyone rather than one side go in all of the difficult, all of the problems, and the other side go in all of the beautiful things and the joys and the excellency. I think we need all of those stories and everything in between. And I think that then that allows us to see black Muslim people as humans, just like everyone else. I, I really echo what uh, the sister Mona is uh, saying now. And many examples in the Sira actually, and it's very interesting because the Sahaba at the time of the Prophet, especially the early times, were numbered and known. So, uh, but there are many stories that are well documented that start by 
the story of Sahabi or Sahabiya who were not named and uh, who were average people and examples of people, mm -hmm. the pro example of a person that the Prophet ﷺ forecasted that he's going to be one of the people of paradise and you and the, uh, one of the Sahabi went after him and they realized that basically what he does is basically he sleeps. The reason why he's entered in paradise is that when he sleeps at night, he has no grudges, no ill feelings towards anybody. He clears his heart before he goes. And that's, as you said, is an important that the, not everybody is a superhero. Not everybody is somebody who uh, uh, is going to is going to make something big. But actually, the is Islam came for everybody, the average person, the exceptional person, the person who's struggling. And I really like this angle. And it takes me to a follow up question here about focus as well. And we focused on the subject and Zahra uh, Khair did this balance in addressing the different subjects, but also the angle of timing. Because we talk about, and, and, and we actually had this discussion with the Sister Maimuna earlier, should we talk about black anti-black racism only uh, in, in the month of February and we ignore it the rest of the year or only when there is an incident that's in the media or is part of our Islamic uh, interest and Islamic perspective is to tackle these social injustices uh, uh, throughout throughout the year. So, and that's also some of the frustrations that we've witnessed in preparing for this show. That we've we're overloaded with requests uh, during that month of February, and then the rest of the year, people have less interest in uh, tackling these subjects. So, what do you comment about timing? Because the uh, the flip side is so: should we not <laughs> address it in February? Or, uh, or what should we do about it? Um, I'm just going to jump on uh, to keep it brief, uh, inshallah. That I think, Brother Khaled, these are really, really important questions that is happening um, in everyday conversation. Um, when I was giving um, a week ago here in one of the universities for Black History Month, um, a, a Muslim Black um, uh, uh, individuals I also added um, stories of Khadija as well as um, other key figures. I, I, I think that um, what I'm trying to get in is that in the month of um, February, even when we are talking about Black History Month, we also um, talk about other key figures of, of our Islam, including Khadija radiallahu anha and Aisha uh, radiallahu anha. So, and, and that is something we grew up, that's something within us, that is our legacy. Uh, I think it's Black History Month and the Black Sahabat and the Black individuals, their history and their legacy should be throughout as well in our seerah. Uh, same as every other um, uh, uh, Sahabi or um, an individual who is currently exist. So if we normalize our city to be inclusive and really make sure that who are we leaving be behind? Are we teaching our students and our daughters and our halaqas only, uh, you know, uh, the, the rijal around the Prophet وسلم, the man that was around the Prophet وسلم, or are we teaching both men and women? And if we teach in that, are we also teaching the black um, and also other uh, uh, key figures, whether they're from Persia or other uh, Roman that was also Muslim Sarah. So I think to keep that diversity in mind will keep us a balance and will make the story throughout the year, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Sister Na'ma. Um, so I think what you both of you have really given us is a lot of pieces that are practical, if I understand. So, you know, these pieces about, you know, learning our history, learning our Islam through this narrative, looking and paying attention to these stories, looking at um, teaching these stories to those around us. We heard Sister Muna talk about, you know, the universality of social justice and the message and these messages of brotherhood, of unity, that we can really take beyond and enrich the anti-black racism discourse as a wider society. And I really thank you all. And we're going to be moving to some questions that are coming in, inshallah. And I think we have somebody online. Yes, I think we have uh, Brother Yasser from Oakville. Uh, he's on the call. Can we uh, get him in? Brother Yasser, Assalamu Alaikum. It's 
So as we just wait to get Brother Yasser on, um, I just wanted to also uh, remind viewers, so we're taking questions at this point. Um, we have, we're going to be uh, taking questions that come in on YouTube. You can type your questions in or join us on Zoom. If you're going to be joining us on Zoom for a live call, it, the meeting ID is 905-822-2626. Do we have Brother Yasser? Wa alaikum salam wa Brother Yasser. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, I hear you. Okay, so uh, we have our speakers here, our guests here today. Thank you for, today. Uh, for uh, Go such ahead. a nice, uh, uh, nice uh, uh, episode, very interesting topic. I'm, I'm glad that we are focusing on this also as Muslim community. Uh, so I have a question. I uh, wanted to ask, uh, what specifically can masajid, schools, and other Muslim spaces do to not just be like in general inclusive, but uh, but more specific to be truly uh, making the black Muslims feel as part of the community? Sister Nama, do you want to address this first? Uh, absolutely. Jazakallah khair, Brother Yasser. I think that's a very important question. There are so many that can be done. It also depends on the city that you're at. Some cities are more diverse than others. Um, uh, and it depends on, you know, the size of the masjid and the community around it. So perhaps uh, it would be good to start with uh, to conduct a study or some sort of a survey to really see the communities that that masjid is serving and, you know, maybe visit around the neighborhood, not only those who are coming, but those who are not coming to the masjid or to the community center anymore to <clears throat> conduct a study survey to figure it out, uh, to uh, emphasize the love and the inclusiveness and the diversity, uh, perhaps to enforce or that message or that organization, if they don't have to establish uh, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, anti-racism policies. If they don't have, if they don't have it, to establish one, and if they do have it, to emphasize it, and also not only just a policy, but a policy with a hadith and ayat to soften people's hearts and say, you know, this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. This is what is our religion is saying. This is what we need to practice. So having that policy posted and the ayat and the hadith that are um, you know, supporting it also posted and actually to take the action and then ask the community around you, what do you need and how we can help? Because every community is different. Sister Nama. Sister Mona, we have a question for you as well um, that's come in. As we start to see more books, media catered to Muslim children, what advice would you give to creators on how to be more representative, especially of bl the black community? So I guess these, uh, this question is coming from somebody who wants to contribute. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sister. That's a beautiful question. I think the important thing to, to realize and to really affirm to ourselves is that we all have a story to tell. We all have a perspective to share. So for any individual that's wanting to also create literature or books or media for young Muslim people or young black people is to really be authentic and just tell you a story, tell the story of your life, of the kids in your family, of the adults in your family, of the joys and, and pains and, and everything in between. So that authenticity and really sharing your story, we could um, all four of us today could experience something, but we would all have a different perspective, a different angle to it. Uh, so that is what I would suggest is to just be authentic and tell your story from your experience, from people around you and listen to that inner voice. And that will strength, give strength to the stories that you share. Um, Sister Maimuna, if I could take and Brother Khalid, just 30 seconds to add to Sister Nima's message about what messages can do. I think it's beautiful to have the hadith and the Quran and the policies, but I think it also goes back to unlearning and challenging the things that we know or what we think we know about race and Islam. It's easy to go to the masjid or be in the masjid and hear the ayahs and the hadith and talk about them. But we all know the story of when people go back to their homes or they go to school or they interact with people of different color when uh, someone calls someone a name because of the color of their skin or black Muslim kids are being bullied in uh, Muslim schools or 
things that happen to domestic domestic workers at home. So I think it also goes back to really what do we practice at home and what do we teach our children much more than uh, just what we do at the masjid, which is also a really important um, aspect of this. Thank you. You took us actually to a very practical uh, point and uh, and one one aspect that we're dealing he here with in this show about perspectives and really trying to formulate uh, this understanding of Islam, this this practical and relevant understanding of Islam in uh, nowadays and in this in, in our context here, uh, that we might be able to give that picture. And as you said, Sister Mona, the, the, the picture could be there and people can have access to it. Practice could be something that is totally different. And uh, our communities also take from uh, some of the social ills that are around us, including, including, including uh, racism. And the fact that you know does not mean that you're going you're gonna to implement. And this also takes us let's, uh, to this final question, if uh, either of you can, uh, can answer, or both of you can answer. And that's, so what can we, how can we take that theory, that beautiful theory we, we discussed here today, and uh, people know about, about Islam's approach to dealing with racism. Uh, uh, what can we do about it and making it a reality and improving our lives and uh, uh, reducing that racism that exists within our wider community or even sometimes within, uh, within our Muslim community? Sister Naamah, do you want to start? I'm learning so much about Sister Mona. I cannot get enough for her to speak. So I was waiting <laughs> for her to speak. No problem. Um, actually, uh, Sister Mona remind me of uh, a, a, a story that I wanted to share. Uh, I'll change the child's name. Um, uh, a child, his name was Abdullah. And the teacher um, in the class was, ch was calling the child Abdi. And it made him sad, but never expressed that issue. Uh, being a child who is from African descent, very dark skin, that bothered him and depressed him. When we investigated, we found out other kids who are from Arab country was calling him Abdi as a slave. And he didn't like that, but at the same time, the teacher was using Abdi as well, uh, just to shorten his name. So sometimes our ignorance can be a harmful thing. So we had to have a conversation with the teacher to say, please call the child Abdullahi, which is his full name. And then the teacher said, well, you know, the child doesn't mind the name to be shortened. So we had to educate the teacher to say what the word Abd and slave and how the other kids in the playground was also making fun of that child and how the child is enforcing that negative narrative. So education for the teacher as well as for the um, other students. But also we had to launch a project to say the teacher make sure that each child has a uh, um, talks about the meaning of their name so just to erase the ill feeling of that child teach him all the hadith that came on the word abdullahi and what the prophet sallallahu said about the beauty of this name just to restore the feeling of that child so i think sometimes within a muslim community when we come to the masjid some of our, you know, systematic racism things might not be intentional, but it's also kind of, you know, um, decoding and, and admitting it. And when you are um, wrong to apologize and alhamdulillah, the teacher was amazing and took the feedback and corrected everything in a swift. So just to answer your question, uh, Brother Khalid, I think it comes back to the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billah min shaitan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa ma so it comes back to the word ta'aruf. Uh, let's get to know each other. Uh, ta'aruf has two sides. It's like I wanted to know everything about you and you should be able to be open to know everything about me. So I think that in order to diffuse, human beings are always afraid of the unknown. What they don't know, they assume. So if we have that ta'aruf emphasis and education, all ignorance can be diffused and brotherhood and sisterhood and love can be cultivated. 
So I think we need to um, emphasize on education and hadith, on education of ignorance and education about racism, and also that to give each other a benefit of the doubt. If somebody, uh, as a black person, that you think you've been mistreated, uh, the Prophet Wasallam said, give your brother or sister the benefit of the doubt in 70 times. So maybe they didn't mean to, maybe they didn't understand you, maybe you understood the wrong, maybe you are carrying a trauma that you need to let go and that you have that filter that you're a little bit defensive. So maybe, maybe. And how can we diffuse all that ignorance is to have that ta'ar of an open conversation, inshallah. Sister Muna, would you like to add anything before we uh, close tonight? Yes, I would. I just wanted to note that I appreciate that we're waiting for each other. Well, <laughs> each of us is waiting for the other one to speak. So <laughs> thank you, Sister Nima. I wanted to add that there is definitely a lot of ignorance and a lot of subconscious bias. Like it, it even happens to us. Like it's internalized sometimes as a black Muslim, you might have internalized uh, concepts or, or uh, notions about yourself or your own community. So whether it's within ourselves or non-black Muslims too, I would like to emphasize that we all have a responsibility to learn. We live in an er the era of knowledge. It's possible to, to learn about uh, the history of black people, about the challenges that black people have in the countries that we live in. It's often um, very common to see other people of color. So it could be Muslims or non-Muslims think, or, or the, everything is good. We live in a civil society, not knowing that a few days ago, someone was shot or someone was killed in the black community or someone was harassed um, because of the color of their skin. So I think it really falls on us as a community, as ummah, as individuals to educate ourselves about the reality of today, as well as learn the history of black Muslims. And like I said, and like Sister Nimr said, I th honestly think a lot of it starts in schools and in homes for children, for the next generation, the messages that we are passing along to them, whether we say it out loud or whether they they just find out it's in our body language, in who we interact with, in who we let our kids marry, in all of that messaging, I think the next generation will pick up. So I think a lot of uh, what we need to fix needs to start with parents and with teachers, educators in the community going back and showing this good example to kids. I would like to um, just share that uh, South Sudanese brother was shot in Calgary. Yeah. Just this Saturday, and in this gathering, I would like to just share with people that maybe are listening to do anything that you can do to stand beside black communities, to uh, contribute, to be an ally, to join protests if you need to. And I just wanted to bring his name up. Um, such a heartbreaking thing that happened just this Saturday in Calgary. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on his soul and uh, bring justice to, uh, to this uh, community. And uh, we really thank uh, both of you today and, uh, and, and we, we're really proud of actually your contributions today because it really uh, shows us that uh, our black Muslim sisters are key to owning the narrative on uh, black Muslims here and now in Canada. And I think uh, I really thank you both for, for these contributions and I encourage actually uh, uh, everybody to follow uh, what you do in one specific uh, in one specific way with Sister uh, Nam Ali, we're gonna share a video uh, about uh, the school that she runs uh, in uh, Abra Mac Abrar School in Ottawa. And uh, I don't think we need uh, we need the video, Sister Nama. Uh, it's enough. I would if I lived in Ottawa, I I would be happy to uh, and proud to have my son in your school. So uh, we will uh, close with this note. And again, Sister. Uh, uh, Mona as well, if you can also, uh, we would, would take your permission to share your uh, uh, the, the, the names of the stories that you've uh, published and your uh, small publishing uh, experience and we pray that inshallah it expands and you contribute more to the narrative on uh, black Muslims and uh, uh, I'll pass it uh, to Sister Maimuna to tell us about what's next. Sure, Jazakallah khair. Um, so uh, thank you both. Yes, just like uh, Brother Khaled has shared, you really are, um, there's so much for us to learn and take, and we hope that we can continue to support and work. And you've given us so much in terms of practically looking at where our community is at and trying to you know, really study and understand how to develop 
that black Muslim narrative. You've given us a lot to think about in terms of how to contribute to the wider uh, discourse, how to look at our history and our teachings within Islam to really base our framework around the anti-black uh, racism discourse. So Jazakilil Khair, and as Brother Khalid said, we will be leaving you with, uh, for a short intermission, um, and you'll be seeing a video from Abrar School in Ottawa, of which Sister Natma is the principal. And uh, come up back, do not leave us. Dr. Jasser Auda will be here for our next segment, where we'll be talking about the higher objectives of Islam. And we'll be back next, and be sure to join us next week, inshallah, again, every Thursday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern time, live, uh, to continue to discuss uh, relevant issues on Islam and life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs>
Oui. J'ai rangé le A et j'ai mis. At Abroad Secondary School, our staff aims for the success of our students. Our goal is to prepare our students for their future by implementing a great learning experience. The Enrich program is mainly created for students to establish the Enrich education through a wide variety of experiences. By enhancing theory with hands-on learning methods, students are able to grasp difficult concepts more easily when they are having fun and seeing the theory bloom into something they created. Character skills such as teamwork, goal setting, leadership skills, and gaining responsibility are effective character traits that can help our students in many ways as they move forward towards their future. Through these extracurricular activities, students will learn how to use these effective and valuable skills for their future. I like Student Council because we plan activities for, this, for the whole school uh, such as art competitions, spirit days, and more. And I'm one of the representatives for grade seven. It's an annual ski trip. You'll have it every year. The other field trips that you could have, you just let your teacher know. It's what the students bring forward. And because students have such a big like leadership role, high school will be as fun as you want it to be in this school. Assalamu alaikum. Today, we're gonna be continuing our media arts unit that we've been working on. We're gonna continue on with uh, the Pixel Art Editor program that we've been using for image editing. Our athletic program includes regular swimming lessons that will give our students lifelong skills. Our swimming program is taught by certified lifeguards from the Boys and Girls Club. In order to accommodate our students and respect their religion and modesty, our swimming program provides a male instructor for the boys and female instructor for the girls. Our school is a member of the National Capital Secondary School Athletic Association and Ottawa Futsal Club. Assalamu alaikum. Abroad girls have wanted a basketball team for a very long time. This year, we are very excited because we have our very first girls basketball team. Our coach, Ms. Qali, is a female coach who is very kind and she grew love into us for the game. She taught us many new skills. Our team consists of girls from different ages. However, we all share the same love and passion for the game. My overall experience, I felt very comfortable with my teammates and I made a lot of new friends. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Husni Al Naji, and I have been teaching science from grade 8 to grade 11 since then. The teachings of Islam are infused in the curriculum. This means that students are not only learning about science, languages, but they, they are also learning about Islam in each and every subject. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Tessa, and I've been involved with Sabar School since 2014. I teach the high school arts program. Art can play a vital role in the young person's development and their sense of self and becoming a well-rounded individual. Muslim youth in particular have such a rich heritage in the arts which they often are unaware of. It brings me great joy to help them broaden their horizons and find their creative voice. We're taking a landscape. So you want to do it this way, right, or slightly to the left. You decide where you want to put it. So half-click focus and then shift your... your your camera a little bit to the left or right. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Nadine Anous and I'm the iRise lead at Abrar Secondary School. Mac iRise strives to nurture a positive school culture rooted in Rabbaniya with a shared language and cooperation between all educational partners, staff, students, parents, and the school community. Jazakum Allahu Khair. I've been in Abrar School since first grade. I really like the school because it's different. It teaches us about how to implement Islam in our lives. It has many special classes that you can't find in other schools. Um, this year we started an iRise program and it teaches us how to implement Islam practically in our lives and it teaches
teaches is important core values such as integrity, responsibility, trust, and citizenship. Um, I like this school because I made a lot of friends here and it's a safe environment to pray and talk about our religion. Assalamu alaikum. When I first enrolled here, I was previously homeschooled, so I was really shy and unsure of myself. But then I met the students, teachers and staff, and everyone was so kind and understanding and friendly. The environment here is just really warm and welcoming. It's home away from home. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I've been in a bar school since grade one. What I really like about this school is that I have many friends here and I can uh, talk to them about anything. And uh, like, for example, I can use like Islamic terms like uh, mashallah, inshallah with them and no one's going to say anything. Also, uh, I really enjoy being able to pray here safely uh, with all my friends. Uh, I've been at Obrar school since I was in third grade all the way until I finished grade eight over here back in the day. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I went to a bar school from grade 4 to 10. Assalamu alaikum. I went to a bar school from grade 1 to 9. For me, my time in a bar school um, was really significant, especially during those formative years when I was in third grade and growing up. And I think it was a really integral part of establishing who I slowly became over the years. Well, for me, I feel like um, it was a lot about the people I met along the way, the teachers that I grew up with, the friends that I grew up with, and those friends that I still keep in touch with to this day, who remind me to do good things in the world, remind me to do, to make a positive impact on those around me. For me, one thing that I remember really clearly about bar school was how it wasn't just about the like regular education that you receive at any other school, but also the moral and the value. <laughs> Currently, I am a second year medical student at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I came there by completing a bar school until grade 8. I did a bar school from 4 to 10, and now I'm pursuing my second year at Ottawa U in biomedical science. So I finished at a bar school after grade 9. I'm at Carleton right now, studying math and computer science in my fourth year. When we look back to our time at a bar school, we look back at it fondly. Um, for myself personally, all the guys that I had in my class that I spent years together with in school and even though it's been at least eight nine years since I left a bar school I'm extremely close with all my friends from that time we spend time together regularly we travel together and we are always there to support each other and encourage each other not only in our career paths but also as brothers together in Islam and I think that this is something that for any parent or child thinking about the future of their education here should seriously consider as we know it's not just about the dunya or the akhirah but we really need to do our best to attain both. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. My name is Fahad and I'm a parent of one of the students in El Abra school. I really encourage everyone who have a high schooler especially high schooler this is the way to go. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Iman. I have two kids attend the school here. So when we moved here, we were looking for a good school that, do, that will keep their Islamic identity at the same time, have um, academic um, excellence. And alhamdulillah, we found those two things here at the school. Um, they have a variety of courses, whether it's selective or, or core courses. I really encourage every parent to bring their school here. Assalamu alaikum. I've been in a Welcome back to our second segment on Islam and life. My name is uh, Maymuna Hussain, and this is Brother Khalid Al Qazaz, and we are your hosts. So welcome back to segment two with Dr. Jess Rauza. And uh, before uh, Brother Khalid um, introduces him and uh, what uh, you know begins with us, I just want to remind you all that this is a live programming, meaning that you can all ask your questions towards the end of our program, whether that's through YouTube or uh, typing your questions in. Or calling in live um, through our Zoom app, uh, uh, sorry, our Zoom call, um, and that is uh, 
2626, which is the meeting ID, and you can ask your questions. So tonight, um, what we want to, we've had Dr. Jesser, I was in here for a couple of sessions now, and what we, we've been defining the Islamic framework, and we want to continue that conversation and talk about uh, the higher objectives of Islam, and where the Khalid will explain a little bit more to us. And uh, inshallah, I think this is an opportunity for all, for all of us to uh, engage with Dr. Jasser, who is a specialist in this uh, subject in uh, Islamic law in general and specifically on Maqasid Sharia or the higher objectives of Sharia and Islam. And, uh, and he agreed to take these uh, few episodes to complete our uh, Islamic uh, perspective. And, and, and today we'll try to explore uh, the position of uh, Maqasid al-Sharia or the higher objectives of uh, Sharia into that uh, worldview and that Islamic uh, perspective. So we start again after welcoming him and asking him that question directly. So what is Maqasid al-Sharia or the higher objectives of uh, Sharia and how does it, uh, uh, how is it positioned within that Islamic framework or Islamic worldview? الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. جزاكم الله خير أبي خالد. This topic might sound like an academic topic that is more fit to a classroom, but it's actually a very important topic for every Muslim to know. Because the maqasid are the higher objectives. They are the purposes, the ends, the answer of the question of why in Islam and Sharia you translate it as Islamic law, that is actually the legislative part of the Sharia. But Sharia is a way of life. It's not just the legal part, it's not just about the fatwa, about the rituals, how to pray and how to do hajj, but it's also how to live your life. So the maqasid and Sharia in that sense are the higher objectives of Islam, the purposes of this deen. And these purposes have many theories, but they all intersect in a very important question, which is the question of why. When you ask why, you start to open the door of the maqasid or the qasd, the hadaf, the ghaya of the sharia. When you ask why, you get three things that we need badly as Muslims. One, you get a comprehensive view of Islam versus a partialistic view. Because once you ask why, you look at the bigger picture. Once you ask, why am I fasting? You look at fasting as a whole ibadah. You're not just asking about a particular thing. And when you ask why, number two, you get a critical view of Islam. Because once you ask why, you are critiquing. Why am I fasting? So this is about taqwa. So therefore, I'm critiquing myself. Am I achieving taqwa? If I'm achieving taqwa, then this is the right why of fasting, and therefore I can evaluate my fasting as successful. Why am I praying? So that prayers take me away from the fahshar al from the evil and ugly deeds. And therefore, if my prayers are doing that, then critically speaking, I am on the right track. If they are not, then I can criticize myself that there is something wrong, I go back. And the third important aspect of thinking that the why brings is the future-oriented thinking. And we as Muslims, we tend to be past-oriented. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a balance between everything. He made a balance in the Islamic thought and the Islamic thinking between looking at the past and looking at the future. We read the Quran only looking for the past stories, but the past stories have a maqsid, have an objective to make us look for the future. How can I achieve the objectives that I learn from the stories? Because the stories have an object. Um, I was uh, following the first part of our program, for example, about black Muslims and, and so forth. When we approach Islamic studies with the why question, we start to be critical about many biases we have in Islamic studies. One of them is the, you can call, the, the anti-bias, the anti-black bias. Um, black is much more than Sayyidina Bilal and Sayyidina Julaybib and Umm Ayman and Rabah and Ubada and Ammar and his mother and father. They are from Africa proper. But many of the companions of the prophets, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were described as Adam. Adam, Adama, Ya'damu, is an Arabic word, by the way. 
And that's why Arabic is the first language of humanity. Because Adam and Hawa are Arabic words. Adam from Adama. And Adam is dark. Uh, so Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib was described as Rajulun Shadidul Adama. He was very dark. Sayyidina Uthman was dark. Sayyidina uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz for that matter was dark from, from Sayyidina Uthman's tribe. Uh, when you look at Sayyidina Zubair, Sayyidina Sa'ad, all of these are described as Adam and as dark. Why? Because Hajar was dark. Hajar, the mother of Ismail, the grand great-grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad was from Africa, basically. And therefore she was dark. And therefore Bani Hashim, like Sayyidina Ali, and Bani Umayyah, like Sayyidina Uthman, were dark. Uh, some of them were more mixed because of um, the Persian um, link, because of a, a Sham or Syrian link. But a good proportion of the companions were dark. And in fact, if you look at the history of the prophets, Prophet Musa was described as Adam Shadil Adam. Prophet Musa was dark. Actually, the pharaohs, most of them were dark. But the history of the pharaohs was rewritten for national interests and for colonial interests. Uh, Isa, in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in, in the Sahih, the hadith is Sahih. And he said, Fara'aytu Isa, if, since the Isra and Mi'raj, there is a lot of talk about it. When he was in the Mi'raj, he said, Rajulun Adam. Isa was dark. Of course, in any church or any place, except in Africa, you find that Isa is a white guy with blue eyes. And that critical approach to Islamic studies is actually a maqasid approach, because we are looking at the higher purposes. One of the higher purposes is al-musawa, or al uh, when the Prophet ﷺ said, al-nasu sawasiya, people are equal. It's the first man in history to say that, by the way. Nobody ever before Muhammad said that everybody is equal. The Greeks said that the nobles are equal, but then women are different and the slaves are different. The Persians, each nation had its notion of equality that is not equality really. But Muhammad is the first one who said the Nasu Sawasi. And therefore, to achieve the higher objective of equality from the Islamic perspective, we need to go back to the Basically, to speak academically, the so colonial narratives. Uh, it seems that uh, yeah. we, you've, uh, you've put Barakallah. so many into the introduction around uh, Maqasid Sharia. Uh, our technical team is asking for a short break and sure. then uh, a sure. couple of minutes and we'll be back. So please stay, uh, stay on, the, uh, on, on the channel and we'll be back in a couple of minutes.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back. So we are here with Dr. Jasser Aouda uh, talking about the higher objectives of Islam, the maqasid. And uh, Dr. Jasser gave us a really nice introduction to understand what it is. And what I'm understanding is that the maqasid really help us to look at the big picture, the whys and the critical thinking aspects of Islam. So if I can continue this discussion and ask you, where do we find the maqasid? How, how you know, how as one approaching this type of critical thinking, big picture, why, asking the why questions, where do we go? How do we you know, approach this? Well, back to the source of knowledge that we talked about in the first episode, which is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet uh, Where do you find the maqasid from? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, all the way to min al-jinnati wa nas If you read the Quran this way, if you read the Quran looking for the why, and the why is mentioned explicitly in hundreds of places in the Quran. When you look for la'alla, la'alla in Arabic means for the reason of, and what you call lam al ta'lil, likayla, this lam means for the sake of. And when you look at the comments, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is the rule and this is what you get out of the rule, that is the reason, the why, the objective of the rule. Uh, if you read the Qur'an this way, you will find that the basic logic of the Qur'an is actually the logic of the maqas, the logic of the why. It is not the logic of causality, as we might think given our current world and how we think about things. We think about causes and, inf and effects, because that is how we grow up thinking in our industrial civilization and our world. But actually, there is a more genuine approach to think in terms of the why. So the rain is falling because of the clouds are colliding and so on. But why is the rain falling? That, that is a question that takes us to the Islamic level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the rain is falling for the sake of the benefit of the people, for the drinking of animals and plants and humans, for you to thank Allah, to wash your sins, to wash your dirt. Like there is a why. And once you talk about the why and depart from the cause and effect kind of thinking, you are actually taking yourself to the area of morality, to the area of higher purposes and the principles of Islam. And once we think about Islam in terms of its purposes, we talked about black Muslims uh, around the Prophet Once you think from the purpose perspective and not just look at the letter, of the narrators, but who the narrators are, and what are their background, and how can you describe them, and how does the impact of their blackness and their darkness impacted them? Uh, you know, those who were black from them, like I mentioned Sayyidina Uthman from Bani Umayyah, and Sayyidina Ali from Bani Hashim. How did this impact the way they do things, versus the other guys whose mothers were Persians or from the north and the south? And that, that becomes a very interesting approach to Islamic studies and to hadith and to our history. When you know that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, out of all the Khulafa in the kingdom of Umayyah, was the only dark king uh, and, and he was the most pious, uh, anhu. And, and you see a different dimension when you look at this kind of approach to Islam versus the approach that looks at Islam only as rituals and as letters. Uh, Dr. Jasser, and uh, if we go a step uh, uh, into the, you, you've dis described the why uh, this approach, but what are the really the objectives of uh, Islam and are they uh, f uh, like finite specific or uh, they are a wider variety of uh, 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 more objectives? Of objectives. Those who make the objectives very finite, as in the five objectives of the Islamic legislation, the preservation of the faith and the souls and the dignity and progeny and wealth. Those who restrict the objectives to these only are doing Islam a disfavor because the objectives are supposed to develop as we develop our Islamic thought. And every time you look at the Quran, you read more objectives as time goes by. Uh, we're talking about the objective of equality. We're talking about the objective of justice, for example. That is an objective of the criminal law in Islam. The whole criminal law is not 
a religious law in the theological sense. It is actually a law that aims at achieving an objective. And that is why if there is poverty in the society, then you don't punish for theft. And if the person committed murder out of mistake, not out of intent, therefore there is no punishment or there's a different punishment and so forth. So once you look at the objectives, you are going to read the Islamic law differently as a law and you're going to read the Islamic way of life differently. And therefore there are so many objectives for every aspect. If you look at the financial aspect, for example, scholars talked about al-rawaj or currency as an objective. So many things in the do's and do nots in terms of monopoly and usury and so on. They aim at achieving currency. The, 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 the Islam has an objective for the society to trade and deal and for the wealth to go around. Um, they talk about the lack of uh, the lack of transparency sometimes and things that are not um, transparent are haram in Islam. When you look at the whole, for example, another, uh, another topic, the halal food. Why, why the halal food? For the sake of the animal and for the sake of the eater of that food and for the sake of the society. So when you look at the halal food and you say that the Prophet ﷺ forbade the slaughtering of an animal in front of other animals. Why? Because the animal has a feeling. The animals are nations like us, the Quran says. And therefore, we need to be careful with how we deal with animals. And we should not mistreat the animal. Otherwise, it doesn't become halal in that sense. And therefore, the halal is not a, um, a rigid kind of ritualistic Islam. This is not Islam. Uh, people who make Islam only about some rituals that are very dry and non-understandable and no asking questions about them are not actually understanding the heart of Islam. The heart of Islam is this maqasid knowledge and that's why scholars put it at the highest level of knowledge of scholars of Islam. Because once you know the why of the halal, the why of the family law, the why of the financial law, then you are applying the law with a lot of guidance and a lot of wisdom behind it. Dr. Jesser, what you're giving us is that this way of approaching Islam and life and you know circumstances is to move away from this limiting cause effect approach, but really from a very wide scope to think about, you know, causality, to think about the whys, to think about, you know, the bigger questions. And so to me, it sounds like this approach um, really is one that empowers us um, in our lives. And so my question then is, you know, within organizations and as professionals um, or, you know, anybody just living day to day life, how um, do we do this? And, you know, what what does it do for us when we apply this maqasid approach of life, to Islam to life? Well, within organizations, if we popularize the question of why and we make it an essential part of any meeting, of any department that we create, of any function or activity that we have, why are we having these activities? Before we say who is responsible for what and how the budget is made and how the schedule is done, we should ask, why are we having this activity? Why are we celebrating that week or that month? And then we define the objectives. And once we ask why from the Islamic perspective, we will find ourselves defining the objectives Islamically, from the Islamic point of view. And therefore, our functions and our activism and our budgets and our priorities are going to address the most important issues because we asked why. And organizations, uh, from especially in the Islamic field, oftentimes start yesterday without planning. Like, w w we started and here we are and let us go by ear. And, and we don't strategize. And strategizing is actually a very Islamic thing. You look at the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. He had objectives and he had a plan and it was a fantastic plan. And this is part of Islam. Um, when you strategize, you also need to um, correct your concepts that you deal with. Because the why, the answer cannot be a wrong concept. Um, the, the why cannot be, for example, freedom. Because Islam approves some of the aspects of freedom and this approves some other aspects. 
And therefore, when we talk about freedom as an objective, we have to be critical from the Islamic perspective about the things that we are not free. I'm not free not to pray or not to give charity or not to fast. I'm not free to do this simply. This is not my money that I give for zakah, for example. This money that's already for Allah, for example. And when we have the right objectives, then we strategize in a good way. And when we question the concepts through the objectives, then we are able to strategize and plan in a better way as Islamic organizations. Just like uh, uh, you, you're, uh, mashallah, going through the concepts and, uh, and the topic uh, uh, fluently, but uh, I, I, I feel that there are many questions that I want to ask and uh, sure. uh, uh, some additional clarification. And I'm sure many of the audience are asking also similar, uh, uh, similar questions. So uh, back to the point when you spoke about uh, an approach to Islam that is not simply uh, ritualistic. So what are the limits there? Because our understanding is uh, rituals and uh, acts of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed are, yes, they do have a wisdom, some we know and some we don't know, but for the fact that they are rituals, then we're obliged to follow and do these, uh, these rituals. So can you just uh, uh, tell us about the limitation in terms of, uh, I, I did not get the understanding that this is either or uh, when it comes to uh, fulfilling and applying the rituals and also looking at life and lifestyle uh, from an Islamic uh, perspective that respects the why and the wisdom behind mm -hmm. things. Wallahi khair. This is an important question, Akhi, because we should not think because of this uh, uh, background that I gave that everything in Islam is valuable. In Islam, there is fixed and there is valuable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِي أَنزَلْ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ وَأُخْرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ He revealed the signs, the ayat to you. Some of them are firmly constructed, muhkamat. They are the core of the book or the mother of the book. And some of them have similarities, have interpretations. So there is, according to the Quran, a fixed part of Islam that is the core part. And there are aspects that are variable. What are the core parts? Um, this is a thousand year or even more debate between scholars. And there are things that every scholar of Islam would tell you that scholars agreed on. One, the rituals. Uh, salah wa zakah, we need Islam ala khams. Kind of, the salah and zakah and hajj and umrah. We're not going to go around the Kaaba differently. We're not going to use another well instead of zamzam. We're not going to pray five um, in, in dhuhr instead of four or six times a day or Ramadan, Rajab, Sha'ban. Anything related to the rituals or what is called in the Quran, al sha'air. Al ta'abudiyat is a bit of a confusing name, but al sha'air. Uh, or the rituals in Islam, these are fixed. And there are rituals as well in the conducts, in the do's and the do nots. Uh, the prohibitions, for example, are fixed. Zina is going to be haram until the end of time. Murder is going to be haram until the end of time. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the book that he harrama, قُلْ تَعَالَ وَأَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ حَرَّمَ So when Allah says that these are haram, these are, according to the Quran, ayatun muhkamat. These are firmly constructed signs. What is not firmly constructed is actually the majority of life. Because, yes, riba is haram, but the rest of the economy is a matter of ishtihad. The matter of, do any kind of company, but don't do riba. And don't do monopoly and don't cheat and, and so forth. But the rest of the economic and the commercial activity is, is open to, to us. Um, in, in the social dealings, uh, there are certain limits on clothing, let's say, for men and for women. Certain limits on people's relations according to the marriage rules and so on. But otherwise, people have any social construction and any um, kind of activity, any kind of festival that they want. These are not part of the fixed parts of Islam. When you look at politics, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we have to consult and we have to be fair. But whether to have a republic or a monarchy, or this is all Islam too. Islam is not giving us a fixed political structure or levels of government necessarily or departments, but it's telling us to firmly make sure that people are consulted and that al-hukam or the rulers, democratic or non-democratic, are not supposed to take from the public wealth to their own wealth, etc. So now the differentiation is between the fixed and the variable. The variable part is where the maqasid applies. 
The fixed part, the maqsid, is what they call it ta'abud, or worship. The love of Allah. I, I pray for the love of Allah. I give zakah wa'at al-mala ala hubbihi. They give their money out of the love of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But otherwise, Islam, when it deals with life, is not a ritualistic religion. It's not like everything we do is governed by a rule, kind of. No, it's not like that. It's governed by a purpose. The rules are for the rituals and the very basic ceremonies of marriage and funerals. You know, a few things that every Muslim knows. But the majority of life is actually open for purposes to uh, influence how we practice life according to Islam. I think this is the really good uh, introduction, uh, connection actually to this idea of an Islamic worldview. So you, you actually clarified for me some uh, important distinction. Uh, when we come to talk about an Islamic worldview, where how we approach life, how do we live our life in Islam? And the guide that you're setting here is that Islamically, we should uh, uh, have a, uh, an Islamic purpose with this lifestyle and with this approach that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and takes us to uh, 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 takes us to actually along his along his path so that's a that's a very important uh, distinction but again some people will get stuck on some of the details and that's uh, when you commented on some of the systems and some of the concepts such as freedom for example mm -hmm. uh, you also went to, went through this very uh, very quickly and uh, uh, the question here is so does this mean what you mentioned here in terms of Islam allows for some freedom but not other freedoms? Mm -hmm. uh, this needs some clarification. So is Islam against freedom? Is Where does freedom sit within that perspective or uh, yeah. worldview? Well, part of the Islamic worldview is not to be black and white and not to say Islam is against freedom or with freedom. It's, it's not like that. Even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about belief and disbelief in the Quran, you know, when you are a mu'min or a kafir in the Quran, he said there are different levels of iman and different levels of kufr. And and he talked about the people of the book. Some of them changed the scripts and so on. He said, they are not equal. Some of the people of the book, and he named them like that, are people who are standing for the truth and they prostrate at night. So the Quran is teaching us not to classify anything in black and white, even belief and disbelief. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the levels of faith from zero to 100, and the levels of this faith, if you wish, or disbelief. So when you talk about freedom, it's not like that. And freedom is not absolute in any society. And whoever thinks that is a person who needs to educate themselves about freedom, you know, about what they think they believe in in Western societies. Because no, I cannot go and harm my neighbor, for example, with something I do. But that's my freedom. But that makes other people harmed, right? And our society defines harm as a material harm. Islam defines harm in a more comprehensive way. And therefore, no, I am not freedom. I, I am not free to defame prophets, even though it could be legal. Uh, I cannot call names Muhammad or Isa or Adam or Nuh or Musa. Why? Because that's where my freedom stops. Oh, but the society allows it in the concept of freedom. But that is a non-Islamic concept of freedom. As a Muslim, I have a, a more limited freedom. And in some places, in some cases, a more open freedom. Um, and, and that is my worldview. Because the law is not necessarily equal to morality. And no scholar of law tells you that. So what is legal? in Canada is not necessarily what is moral. And every scholar of law knows that, that you know, alcohol is legal, but many people don't drink, including Muslims, and so forth. Wheat that is you know, polluting our air now here in Toronto is, is legal, but it's not moral from the Islamic perspective. And therefore, it doesn't mean that Islam is against freedom. It means that Islam defines freedom differently. And it defines freedom in a more, as Muslims say, guided way and a more godly way, and a more uh, faith-based way. And yes, the society could define freedom based on a philosophy of liberty that we agree on as Canadians, but that's for the law and how to run the country. That's not for the faith. The faith is different, and every Canadian has a different faith in that sense. 
I would like to remind the audience that uh, uh, you can send in your questions on the YouTube chat or you can call in uh, using, using uh, Zoom uh, meeting ID uh, 905-822-2626. Uh, and uh, we'll take the questions in a few minutes, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Jasser. Um, and so what you're really sharing with us is for those of us living here in Canada, uh, perhaps growing up even in this context, there is the Islamic framework, um, and then there's you know the dominant framework that you know uh, we we've been accustomed to, and we kind of think, and oftentimes we default to defining our concepts, our approaches to life, um, our problem solving skill sets, using that default framework sometimes. And we haven't always been able to, you know, manage that flexibility that you were talking about in applying the Islamic framework, looking at concepts and defining um, our parameters and all of these things using this maqasid approach. And you gave us one example from an organizational perspective, how we can do that, you know, asking the big why picture, which can then define how about as individuals, <coughs> excuse me, navigating everyday life, how do we negotiate this you know, uh, moving between the Islamic framework and then, you know, fitting that in or uh, negotiating that within the wider framework that we all are living in. Yeah, one of the maqasid, one of the higher maqasid of Islam uh, are, is called al shahadatu ala al-nas, to be witnesses upon humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah, كَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ We have made you a moderate, a centrist, a center point nation. So that, or community, so that you are witnesses upon humankind. We have an objective to be the standard to humankind between two extremes. Between the extreme of the right and the left. Socially and economically and morally. And every, you know, people uh, take an extreme and never get married in the name of religion. Or take an extreme and they are totally promiscuous. Islam is the, the middle path. People take an extreme of putting themselves to hunger and not enjoying their lives and so on. Or take an extreme of indulging in the worldly lives. Islam is moderate. Um, as an individual, I should always try to be balanced between the extremes that I see in my society. Uh, some people believe in the control of the state to the resources, like a la communism kind of thing. They want everything to be done by the state in a leftist uh, perspective. And some people believe that the society has to be free uh, for, for the rich to eat the poor and the strong to eat the weak. M Islam is neither left nor right. As an individual, I should be balanced between the monopoly of capitalism and the monopoly of communism. And when I deal with the society, I deal for the sake of a balance between the rich and the poor. Therefore, if I'm a rich person, I should donate to others. I should make sure I help the disadvantaged and the downtrodden and so forth. Um, people sometimes go to the extreme left uh, in terms of everybody is equal. Humanity is all equal and we all have different roles and different, uh, same roles and same responsibilities. And some people say, no, there is a patriarchy or a matriarchy or whatever. Islam is neither. Islam is not patriarchal or matriarchal. And it, it's not all equality to all. It's not like that. Islam does not equate men and women because men have certain responsibilities and certain obligations. And women have certain responsibilities uh, and, and rights. And therefore, it balances as a man, I have a privilege, if you want it to be a privilege or a right, to lead my family. But if I'm going to be a leader of my family, I'm also responsible for them yeah. and for their affairs and for their well-being. Yes. I, I cannot be a leader and then I am not responsible and they have to listen to me and I have no responsibility. Or I cannot be responsible and then I, I have no weight, I have no respect that is special. Uh, right. And a, a, a woman, for example, in Islam, has priority over her children. Allah forbid, in cases of divorce in the family law, or in cases of even the family running everyday business, 
a woman has a, a advantage of being closer to the children and that doesn't mean again black and white that she doesn't work and doesn't study no nobody said that the female companions went with the prophet to war not just study and and do business uh, but to because she has a responsibility to take care of the children she has rights over the children and that these rights are balanced so my point is for the individual when i understand ummatan wasatan litakunu shuhada we are a balanced nation so that we are witnesses upon humankind we should set the example of balance yes. the example of a balanced nation or community that is setting the standards. Right. Um, unfortunately, we don't set the standards anymore as Muslims. The standards of cleanliness and development and human rights and freedoms. We don't set these standards anymore. And they are set by international organizations that are influenced by the, the politics of the time. We as individuals and as a community uh, at different levels, we should take Islam in a different road by thinking about it this way, so that we can play a role in, in the civilization of today. We do, um, and thank you so much for giving that practical kind of grounding in terms of how to approach this, uh, Dr. Jasser. Uh, we have a question that's come in. Um, Assalamu alaikum. What is the methodology Muslim scholars use in deriving maqasid al-sharia from the religious texts? Oh, mashallah. <laughs> uh, well, well. Um, I, I do teach this for a course, for a graduate course, for 33 <laughs> hours, uh, what I teach. Uh, but to summarize, the methodology is to centralize the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And read them this way, read them looking for the correction of the concepts, the definition of the universal laws, the ultimate uh, priority of values, uh, the wisdom behind the commands. Uh, I mean, there are so many sides of reading the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger وسلم, with maqasidi eyes, with purpose oriented eyes. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, then we are going to deal with knowledge differently because we are not going to disciplinize knowledge in the usual way if we approach Islam in a purpose oriented way because every discipline that comes from academia, and I'm an academic, I taught in academia, when you teach within a particular department, you have what they call a particular epistemology. And yes. um, the Islamic approach is wider than that, is an approach through the purpose that breaks the, if you wish, the epistemological silos of disciplines. And when you deal with a phenomena like racism, as we dealt with in the first hour, you don't deal with it only as a legal issue mm -hmm. or as a social issue or as an economic issue. Islam deals with it as many sides of it. And therefore, if you ask about how scholars take this approach to renew Islamic studies, um, we're trying to renew Islamic studies beyond the disciplinizations of academia into a studies that focus on the real phenomena. Right. And when you focus on the real phenomena, you're going to integrate the uh, Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu with the reality. Um, not dealing with the reality in a secular way, dealing with the reality from the framework of the Quran and Sunnah. And that kind of approach, I believe, is going to contribute to humanity. Because Muhammad didn't come only for Muslims. When he forbade us from usury, for example. Usury is evil. And it hurts uh, societies and it destroys civilizations. And, and when, it, when we approach Islam this way and we try to call for a trade or an economy that is usually free, we're actually doing our society a service. Whether the society takes it through the legislative channels or not, that's, that's a matter of majority, that's a matter of political will. But as Muslims, we have to be witnesses over humankind this way. We tell them that uh, we believe in family values. We believe in fair trade. We believe in the uh, right dealing um, of the family uh, and the neighbors and the animals and the environment and so forth. And therefore, when we approach Islam this way, academically, Islamic studies is no longer clergy 
kind mm. of studies because this is not an Islamic concept to start with. Islamic studies is for life, is for fair trade and uh, justice in society. So we have another question from uh, Abu Omar on uh, YouTube and uh, uh, he's asking a very broad question. However, uh, I think we will actually have to spend uh, a whole uh, episode on and he's asking but you can give us a, 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 an answer that makes him wait until next uh, uh, next episode. So he's asking how can justice be achieved or established uh, in society from an Islamic perspective? Well, uh, justice in Islam is not just a legal construct, it's not just a legal concept. Uh, Al-Adl is a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I remember once I was giving a a lecture at Yale University in the Faculty of Law, and I had a little debate with a professor of law there who said that he doesn't believe in justice. And I told him, you're a professor of law, and you don't believe in justice. He said, because justice is a construct of the law and the state. I told him, from my perspective as a Muslim, justice is one of the names of God, and therefore justice is a value in the society, and not necessarily the way law, positive or natural law goes. It's not just a philosophy of the law, but a value in the society. So how does Islam establish justice in a society? To start with the individual. The individual has to act justly and fairly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look for the word adil in the Quran, search, you will find him talking about family and trade and war and peace and so as many aspects. And therefore, as an individual, I am observing justice in my conduct as a family. Islam has a family system that's based on justice. As a society and as a community, mosques, uh, our sisters complained that uh, some people have different um, standing in mosques. That is not justice and that's not Islam. In the mosque of Muhammad Sallallahu you find Bilal the African and Suhaib the Roman and uh, uh, Salman the Persian and Omar the Arab and you find Aisha and you find Hafsa, and you find men and women, and you find black and white. A mosque in Islam proper doesn't differentiate between races and doesn't differentiate between men and women. Yes, we have rows of men and then rows of women because we don't pray beside each other. Men and women who are, you know, foreign to each other. It's not the Islamic conduct. But otherwise, people are equal in the mosque. That is how we can apply justice to a social setting, like a mosque. Um, you apply justice to the family, as I mentioned, by balancing rights and responsibilities. Not everybody is equal because people have different rights and responsibilities by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book. Uh, and therefore, we have different inheritance laws. We have different ways of doing wills. Islam has a social system that is based on justice. The basic rule in inheritance is not equality. It's actually justice. And we can get into that if you wish. But basically, how to establish justice is to learn more about how Islam aims at achieving justice. And I always mention Al Qayyim, a great scholar of Islam, who has a very interesting say. And he said, Sharia is all about justice. Every opinion that takes Sharia from justice to injustice, it is not Sharia to talk injustice, even if you do so according to an interpretation. So he is putting justice above interpretations, basically, scholarly speaking. And that is the core of the Islamic fiqh. The Islamic knowledge puts these values at the core of Islam and then builds the rest of the Islamic approach to life around these core values. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Dr. Jasser. Um, you know, building on this whole concept or uh, the, uh, the notion of the Islamic framework each episode, alhamdulillah, I think we've been able to develop a good depth and you're giving us, you know, the theoretical but also the practical. And what I'm understanding from uh, at least the Maqasid al Sharia perspective tonight is, you know, it widens our scope, it moves us away from this limited, you know, cause effect form of thinking. It gives us, you know, this purpose of witness to humanity, um, all of these things. And um, and I think it's been helpful for you to really give us those pieces to think about the whys and the causes behind things. Uh, so Jazakallah khair, I think we're going to um, end tonight, but we're blessed to be having you back again, inshallah, um, to continue this conversation next week. Um, and we invite our viewers back as well. 
um, every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time um, to continue these conversations, inshallah. Um, and before we go, I, I don't know if you want to add anything, yeah, Brother Khaled. some teaser about the next uh, Yes, <laughs> please episodes. go ahead. So every time you mention a topic or a concept or a phenomena that you speak, uh, I, I have uh, reg registered them into a potential, uh, a potential episode because <laughs> it is not justice. To, uh, we, we're not going to give these topics justice if we mention them in a couple of minutes alone. So sure. I think uh, uh, we, we attempted initially to approach uh, the concept of uh, the Islamic worldview and, and, and the maqasid or the higher objectives uh, from a hierarchical approach. I believe maybe in the next few episodes we actually uh, go and understand these objectives and this worldview by discussing uh, uh, important concepts and uh, phenomena, and from them we can uh, get an appreciation of these objectives, inshallah. inshallah. So hopefully this, uh, this is going to be, we can talk about, uh, as you mentioned, issues of racism, uh, justice, and so social justice, and so on, in the next uh, few episodes, inshallah. More than happy. Jazakumullah khairan for being with us. You can make a closing dua for us before we end. Alhamdulillah. ربنا لا تؤاخذنا ان نسينا واخطانا ربنا لا تحمل علينا يسنا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما تنفعنا به يا رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاكم الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمه الله Islam in Life is an online production by the Muslim Association of Canada.